hello, I'm Elisa Lagama, the Seal and Michael E. Pulitzer Curator here at the Metropolitan, and I'm thrilled to be speaking from the galleries. Today, I'm joined by Mantia Diawara, a leading public intellectual in the humanities and citizen of the world, who is university professor at NYU. Our subject is the major cultural crossroads presented in the exhibition Sahel, Art and Empires on the Shores of the Sahara. The expansive geography it covers spans the modern day nation states of Senegal, Mali, Guinea, Mauritania, and Niger. In seeking to bring the originality and grandeur of the region's pre-colonial legacy to life, we set the scene with a three-ton megalith hewn from stone a thousand years ago in Senegal as part of an ancient open-air ceremonial site. This monument in the form of a massive lyre was transported from the entrance to the Ifan Museum in downtown Dakar to the threshold of the exhibition here in New York City. The idea of dynamic change in the context of cultural continuity is brought to life through a cavalcade. That procession of fired clay, carved wood, and cast brass metal warriors mounted on horseback, shaped by artists across the region, relate to the succession of states that arose there over the course of a millennium. Since March, the global pandemic has transformed our frames of reference, both conceptually and in terms of realities on the ground. In the US, Americans are awakening to the fact that our history is inextricably tied to that of Africa. While in the Sahel, Mali's fragile democracy has fallen to a military coup. In this context, I took the opportunity to go back to one of Professor Diawara's signature texts, In Search of Africa. This highly personal and engaging book shaped by formative experiences in Guinea, Mali, and Senegal, takes an inter interdisciplinary approach that we've sought to emulate in the exhibition. Mantia, your writings so powerfully reflect firsthand experience of a world that emerged following the colonial fracturing of the Sahel region. It's a great privilege to have this opportunity to discuss an array of issues you've addressed in relation to the exhibition and the moment we find ourselves in. The Sahel exhibition closes on the eve of European colonialism in the contested city of Segu. Segu emerged as the capital of a mighty state of the Bamana people at the beginning of the 18th century under the leadership of the formidable hunter and warrior Biton Koulibaly. The Fulani reformer El Haj Umar Tal viewed Segu as a citadel of paganism. Tal's 1861 conquest of Segu marked the culmination of a military campaign against idolatry launched from present-day Senegal. Claimed by the French in 1890, since 1960, Segu has been at the geographical center of the modern nation state of Mali. In the exhibition, we offer two distinct pathways of material culture created prior to the 20th century. On one side of the Avenue of Equestrians, we take a chronological approach defined by powers that flourished in the region, ancient Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Segu, and the Umarian state. On the other, 
works are situated in relation to the avenues of knowledge that inform our understanding of this legacy. Oral tradition, music, trade, Islamic scholarship, archeology. span When Berber merchants first crossed the Sahara in search of gold by the late seventh century, they developed trade with the state of ancient Ghana that was situated in what is today Mauritania. Ancient Ghana's 11th century collapse has been seen as the catalyst for a major diaspora of its Soninke population. Ancient Ghana or Wagadu's demise is the stuff of legend. Mantia, can you evoke that for us and share your thoughts on how that dispersal of the Soninke people from its capital Kumbi Saleh has been characterized as an event of enduring consequence? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alisa Lagama for inviting me, but more importantly for this incredible, extraordinary exhibition uh, that imagines the Sahel as a regional entity uh, with identity shared from place to place. Uh, so thank you very much and congratulations. Now the dispersion of the Sony case of Wagadu of Ghana uh, was told me from my childhood by the griots, or as we say in the Soninke area, by the Geseres. What is fascinating to me, or what fascinated me in the story most, uh, most of all, uh, is one story about a woman, a young woman, Sira, and a man called Mamadou Sehedokote. Sehedo Kote in Soninke means taciturn, Mamadou the taciturn. Now, Sira was the most beautiful uh, woman, young woman growing up and uh, suited by all the men. Uh, but she fell in love with Mamadou. Mamadou also fell in love with Sira. And uh, a very dramatic day arrived when Sira is chosen by the king of Ghana to be sacrificed to the Bida of Ghana. That is the spirit uh, at dwelling in the well uh, who picks up the most beautiful woman every year. And Mamadou, who does not speak much, uh, was not happy about this sacrifice. He told Sira and Sira said, this is an honor for me. I'm selected as the most beautiful woman. And traditionally, I have to do this. I love you, but this, I really have to do this. This is an honor that really uh, flatters my family, my ancestry, and myself. I have to do this. So anyway, Mamadou did not say much. But the day of the sacrifice, they put Sira on a very stellar horse, uh, very beautiful, and dressed her in uh, her garments of uh, a bride. They took her to the place of sacrifice, to this well, and Mamadou was hiding in the bush, and uh, Mamadou uh, came out when the people left and killed uh, the spirit, which uh, had seven heads, basically. And each time that he chopped one head off, the head flew to some part of the world, cursing the son in case. All the way to the seventh head, and they will say, you will never have gold again. You will never have uh, salt again. You will never have uh, millet again. You will have to go to different places to seek, to seek those elements for yourself after this uh, original scene, basically. Now, I was really fascinated when I was young, when I heard this story, and I was wondering all the time, uh, but why did he kill the spirit? Why were, the, you know, the curse was made? And so when I thought that through, as the other thing that came to me was Islam itself. Mamadou is Mohammed, uh, the taciturn, 
And Muhammad, as you know, is the, the name of the prophet in Islam. So our point was, I mean, the point in the story was that a Muslim who came uh, to this area saw a sacrifice, which was a paganist, pagan sacrifice, and had to kill uh, the, uh, end the idolatry. And when you think seriously about that, I think you also have a summary of our, the history of our region. Islam has been in our region since the sixth century, but mainly, mostly two uh, versions of Islam. One is very much uh, uh, Islam coming through uh, trade. So this, I would call this the modern, the modernist Islam. You know, Islam comes to modernize us. Let's say there is something new in Morocco, Islam brings it. There is something new in some other places, although from Saudi Arabia, Islam brings it. There is that kind of Islam. It still exists. It doesn't interfere with idolatry, uh, African mask, African traditions, basically. But there is the reformist Islam, and Mamadou may have been the first reformist who refused to have a, a, the coexistence with uh, the Bida of Ouagadou. So, so uh, this is a story that marks a transition in the accommodation of two distinct worlds coming together. Absolutely for me. And, and that still is with us today. When you look at uh, Mali, Senegal, Guinea, we always are dealing with this push and pull between the conservative reformist Islam and the modern uh, open to business uh, progressive Islam. They are there and they're watching each other. Mm -hmm. So when the Soninke disperse um, throughout the Sahel and beyond, um, they eventually become part of the Mali Empire, which uh, extended across many of West Africa's, what are today West Africa's national boundaries. Uh, the Mali Empire was the largest state this region has ever seen into the present. Following Mansa Musa's 1324 pilgrimage to Mecca, the most advanced European maps from the late 14th century on, including this one on view in Sahel, portray the Malian emperor as one of the major world leaders of the day. These pictorial representations, however, define Mande leadership in terms of a Western imaginary. In contrast, Mande Monday griots or bards immortalize ancient Mali's founder Sundiata through the verbal imagery of their own culturally distinct vernacular. Their voices have played an outsized role as historians, advisors, and singers who perpetuate the memory of the accomplishments of regional leaders and of family. The lyrics sung in celebration of Sundiata's feats are about greatness and seek to establish continuity between the shining moment of Mande origins and the present. In Sundiata, an epic of old Mali, Ghanaian historian Jibril Tamzir Nyan foregrounded parallels with Western epics. Can you speak to the significance of Nyan's project to introduce the Sundiata epic more broadly to national and international audiences and evoke for us some of its Mande imagery? The Tamsir Nyan's, Jibril uh, Tamsir Nyan's Sundiata and old epic uh, of, of Mali uh, is. I think one of the most important books coming out of that, uh, the Sahel region. Uh, it's very important, as you just said, one, because it shows Mali as an empire through the telling of an epic, the epic of Sunjata, you know, the epic hero, uh, 
like a uh, chanson de Roland, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, like Homer, Gilgamesh, uh, the hero who is forced to leave his home, goes outside, learn for initiation, learn how to fight and come back to build the nation, to build the empire, to colonize uh, other territories, basically. Now, that story, that is more or less linear, teleological. Uh, you can look at it from the beginning of Sunjata to the end of Sunjata, roughly. That story is, first of all, very important to Malians, to Senegalese, to Gambians, and so on. But Sunjata in Jibril Tamsirnyan's uh, book is also a myth, you know, Sometimes it, it's, it's the first book, really. Well, I, I think in many ways, if if you read uh, the, the the Odyssey, you can see the same thing: the singer of tales. Uh, the griot for us is as important as the king, and and the book really put that in the light uh, by interviewing. Griots from the area of Guinea and Mali, he constructed a story which basically is also a mythology because the griots, when they tell a story, uh, of course, Sunjata is the kernel, the, 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 uh, the main structure of this story, it's around Sunjata, but it's a, it's a story that can go from uh, the 13th century to the 20th century, back and forth, and include people, exclude people. So, so you have on the one hand this linear story, on the other hand you have this mythical uh, story uh, coming together. And what is great in the Sunjata story is that I think some of the songs actually uh, say more about the significance of being a Mandenka, a person from the Mandeng, being uh, a citizen of this area. Uh, they have a few songs. You know, one uh, is about Sunjata himself. Sunjata was this crippled person, like most epic stories, who did not walk, some people say, until he was 18 years old. And one day he was upset uh, because people made fun of his mother. Why don't you tell your crippled son to go and get some baobab leaves uh, for you instead of begging us all the time. And Sunjata said, from today on, all the women of Mande will come to your house and beg for baobab leaves. And Sunjata walked that day, and the iron bar that he used become his ball, and that's what he fought with. Uh, so it, it, this song still is there and sung to Mali's heroes. So it's permanent. There is a permanence going on that the more the Malians evolve, the more permanent they are. So we, this is against the teleological story that you also mentioned all the way to Kan, uh, Kanku Musa. Kanku Musa who traveled from Mali all the way to Mecca and is considered to be the richest man in the world still today because he had so much gold. The stock market fell uh, 14th century. So you have these two things coming together. But Tamsil Nyan is very important because he was able to give the Mandang version, the Mandang side of the story, as opposed to uh, just let's have an epic. He, his stories include many songs that would not have had any significance had it not been for his transcription of these songs. So he was very important. The story we tell in Sahel is one of major regional and trans-Saharan networks of exchange that translated into immense cultural vibrancy. You foreground the dynamism of African markets and centers of trade as hubs for innovative commodities and ideas. The development of ever widening commercial ever wider commercial networks expanded Sahelian economies as well as its people's notions of their political and religious affiliation. 
Can you comment on the enduring role of traditional markets in West Africa? You know, in the beginning of this talk, I was congratulating you for bringing in your exhibition, The Sahel Imaginary. The Sahel Imaginary is really defined in marketplaces uh, in West Africa. Uh, the, this is where people come, let's say you will have uh, somebody come from Mali and they find themselves in Abidjan. Somebody else come from Senegal, they are in Abidjan, or Guinea, they are in Abidjan. And they all meet in the marketplace. And they meet in the marketplace and they create new relations in marketplace. So in a sense, the marketplaces in this area from Kumbi Sale uh, to uh, Segu uh, to Timbuktu to, uh, again, I was mentioning Abidjan, but it could also be Brazzaville. The, the marketplaces were for us the learning places, the, the schools, the universities, because that's where you, you know, when a businessman arrived, let's say from Kankan in Guinea to the marketplace in uh, Abidjan, because I was talking about Abidjan, the, he usually is joined not only by his family, but his griot from Kankan come to join him. Uh, the other people in, in Kankan who want to do business, they come and join him and he find them jobs. And then they tell the history, the stories of Kanka in the marketplace. When I was growing up, for example, uh, I've not gone to school yet. Uh, my mother every morning will tell me, wake up, go to the market. Maybe you'll meet your luck there. Because the market is where you meet everything. If you don't go to the market, you don't learn about socialization. If you don't go to the market, you, you, you don't really... Uh, imitate people so that you can become either a trader of African textile or cola nuts and all these things. So the, the market is the place where heroes are defined. I, I was saying earlier about this song called Jula. You know, it's the market man who is called Jula. Uh, the Jula replaced uh, people like Tiramakan in the Sunjata epic, the Traore warrior, the jewelers replaced Sunjata himself, the horsemen that we used to have in the, uh, uh, in the Ghana empire. Today, all these things are today's jeweler. Today's businessmen in this, in this market uh, have really taken on the, the most important uh, epithets of heroism in my area. So that somebody like myself, I don't know anything about trading. Uh, most of what I do is reading and writing and thinking. But when I go back to Mali, I will be the jeweler of New York. This is why the markets are so important. Weddings are promised there. Naming ceremonies are announced there. Uh, wars are also announced there. People, when people want to fight, it starts in the market. And for the good reason, the market, they feed 70% of population in that West African area. And if you, if you can, if you go back a little bit in, the, in history, in the uh, mid 80s to the present, when they wanted to, the World Bank IMF wanted to restructure the system of taxation, these markets began to catch fire in Ouagadougou, in Bobo Julasso, in Abidjan, in Bamako, in Kankan, in Dakar, the Kermel market. So they had to get rid of this market, the so-called informal economy, in order to formalize, so-called formalize the economy. That's how crucial the markets are in these areas. They really are the heartbeat of the community. They, they are what gives you a sense of what is most important and what is at the forefront of everybody's conversations and concerns. In the Sahel exhibition, we present material artifacts as immediate points of connection with earlier epics. The works assembled are themselves primary sources produced in response to unfolding historical events 
otherwise unchronicled by the griot or texts written in Arabic. We discuss the fact that in order to afford a holistic account of the past, one relies on a synthesis of sometimes contradictory perspectives. Among the landmarks featured in the exhibition is one of the treasures of Mali's National Museum that you see now on the screen, excavated at the Inner Niger Delta site of Gene Geno. This depiction of a corpulent androgynous reclining figure appears to have been deliberately defaced and discarded around the time of the city's abandonment in the 14th century. Your own writing reflects on the weight of the past that you suggest may represent an obstacle that hinders social progress. In Search of Africa reflects a certain ambivalence about the place of traditional artifacts and institutions like that of the griot in contemporary society. You provide a sympathetic reading of the American author Richard Wright's position that in order for Africa to compete on a global stage, it must be prepared to shed tradition and fully embrace modernity. How do you reconcile respect for tradition with forging a vision for the future? It's, it's, it's a difficult question, very important question, uh, but I think our task, uh, your exhibition, my work, is to really try to address this question. Uh, on the one hand, the power of tradition in capturing identities that have become permanent with us. Uh, the power of tradition in really uh, even giving you a philosophical language. In my, in my area, uh, which you know very well, in whether it is Mande or Soninke, uh, the song guy, they, their sense of self-knowledge is really defined from uh, tradition and has not evolved much. Uh, that is, if somebody will really want to mock you in my area, uh, from Guinea to Mali to Senegal and so on, they want to mock you, they'll say, you do not know yourself. And when they say that, they, they, they mean that you don't know your father, you don't know your great grandfather, you don't know all the way to the beginning of uh, your kinship. And tradition, how the tradition succeeded in really fixing this is something that, that I admire sometimes, but that also annoys me sometimes because uh, you get a sense that you cannot invent yourself outside of tradition. Even though there are, you know, there are senses among the Bamana, for example, when they say, uh, if I, if I didn't follow, your father is your first competition. Most Bam, if you go to Cebu, but Cebu is very different in a sense from the Ghana empire, the self-knowledge, because Islam came to the Ghana empire earlier and some of the ways of knowing ourselves are uh, learned from Islam. But, Beginning with Jenne, I think what you just said is very important. When I visited Jenne and went to Jenne Geno and, and then went back to Jenne and saw the mask, when you, you become, you, you, can't, you can't help it as a human being, whether you're from that area or not, you become so uh, impressed by the past you become so, you fall in love, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of sublime, you get dizzy, you don't know where you are. You know, my first visit, I bought land in, in, in Jenne, and my dream was to go there and sit down and write books and argue with the, 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 the marabouts of Jenne and so on. But anyway, so tradition is quite important in that sense. Uh, they always, it, the griots always, want to you want you to emulate 
your fathers and their fathers, and it all go in, in our case, it will go to Kayamagansi, say in the Mali case, it will go to uh, Sunjata Keita and so on. So tradition, in a way, I grew up in the 60s, tradition was seen as a serious handicap to modernity, to equality, to the abolition of caste. Many people say, we, don't, we do not have caste in the area, but I think we do. Uh, from uh, a blacksmith to a leathersmith to a griot to a, to a farmer, uh, people's lives are always uh, run, uh, defined through uh, their belonging, who they are. Are, they, are you the son of a blacksmith, for example? So, uh, so tradition in that sense was not, was under attack by Mali's first president, Modibo Keita, by Guinea's first president, uh, Sekou Toure, even by Ghana's first president, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, because tradition was a handicap toward uh, equality. And of course, the, the, the men I just mentioned were with Franz Fanon, were with uh, Richard Wright, who were very much comrades, uh, fellow travelers with Marxists and communists. So these were the first people who taught me as a materialist and to rise against tradition as the only solution to transforming our societies. Of course, today I, I'm uh, older, uh, and I look at tradition uh, with more romantic eyes, with more sensibility today. Uh, but I still have these doubts in my mind. Mm -hmm. You wonder whether others are being perhaps deprived of the opportunity to define themselves that you yourself embraced as a young person and yes. sort of you invented such a unique and original role for yourself that transcends any one world um, and, and, and tradition can sometimes hold us back from those kinds of opportunities. Yeah, yeah I mean, you look at tradition, they were, for example, let me give some quick examples. Uh, for example, somebody with my last name uh, was not supposed to be reading the Quran. In my area, certain last names read the Quran for us. The Wages, the Sisokos, the uh, Sises, they read the Quran. A Jawara didn't read the Quran. Uh, so a marriage was forbidden between certain uh, clans in my area. Uh, even today still, if you look at Mali's government, if you look at Guinea's government, if you look at Senegal government, if you are of certain last names, that's the first thing that comes to people's mind. And they say, oh, so-and-so is a, I don't know, give a typical uh, last name, uh, Sisoko, or last names that supposedly were casted uh, last names. They say, you can become president of Mali if you are not a Keita, if you are not a Traore, and so on. Mm -hmm. This still haunts us today. So this mm -hmm. is why it was, uh, for me, I couldn't just praise tradition without making this criticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yet, you know, in the West, we often present tradition as far more static than it really is in actuality and yeah. um, one of the things that I often try to impress upon our audiences is how uh, traditions like the Sahelian ones that we're presenting continually are absorbing innovation and the very approach to relaying Mande history itself is original with every telling um, and when you yourself write about the polyvalent, interconnected, and performative nature of expression being so important, that is in itself by definition something that is never 
um, fixed. It's always um, sort of um, highly inventive in terms of the um, the individuals who are acting it out. So one of the things that we try to do in Sahel is situate the fixed material in relation to the more ephemeral dimensions of culture uh, that are um, part of a totality of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we foreground the music of master kora player Tumami Yabate, as well as the renewal of Banco or local adobe architecture on an ongoing basis. And one of the things that I wanted to ask is that, um, you know, it's clear that on national and international platforms, the musical legacy of the Sahel has resonated with global audiences far more fluidly than the visual traditions. And that really um, came home to me in a very powerful way this past March when Baba Mal performed here at the Metropolitan and there were all matter of people in the audience from every community in New York City, but many of them are people who, even though they came into the building to hear him, wouldn't necessarily make the transition to seeing this exhibition. And so I wondered what your thoughts are on why music makes this transition uh, so much more easily than the Sahelian visual corollaries. Yes, uh, in many ways, again, another very important question uh, is, Part of the difficulty, in many ways, when you think about, I think about this all the time. Uh, I would uh, write a whole essay on something Malian or Guinean or about the world, and listen to a Salif Keita song or Baba Mal song. Uh, even before they say a word, they just they play one string or two, and it makes more sense than what I have been writing all this time. And so that Africans in West Africa, in my area, again, I don't want to be too uh, generalizing, but in that, uh, the, the first group, in my opinion, that achieved excellence in the trade art the the griots the griots and maybe i should say quickly something about the griots uh, griot they also call uh jelly in bamana or uh, in mandenka mm -hmm. jelly actually means blood so griots like to say that they are the blood that circulates among the people and bring them together and bring harmony and, and griots like to say, I can talk to you, and this reminds me of what you were saying when you were talking about different people coming to listen to Baba Mal. Uh, I can talk to you the way I talk to your father, I talk to your wife, I talk to your mother, I have no frontier. So their music, everything, music, no barriers. There is a fluidity. So griots are very important in that sense. But I think perhaps at least when I thought about it uh, and reading about poetry and authors like uh, Edward Glissa and so on, I think that the, the music, mundane music is important because it is on the one hand very primordial going, sending us to the, the beginning of the world where all the, mu the first musics of the world the chords echo those, but at the same time, they're very modern. If you take, you mentioned Tumani Jabate. If you take Tumani Jabate, Tumani Jabate's father, uh, Siddiqui Jabate, 
was the personal grio of Secretary of Guinea. And he, most of the time, the repertoire was very rich, but not widely disseminated. There were songs from the Sunjata epic. There were songs like Kaira. There were songs like Sunjata. There were songs like Tiramaka, uh, like Duga. And whenever he played at the, one of these songs at the national radio, uh, people knew that something was happening in Guinea. So people stayed home. Because, for example, if I give you the example of Duga, which is sung by the Tumani Jabati and everybody else, but played by his father, it's, it's about, Duga means vulture. And when Sunjata could not defeat his arch enemy, Sumanguru Kante, or Sumauro Kante, depending on the region where you are, uh, the Griyo came and sang a song and said, tomorrow I want the vultures to cover the sky. And of course, the war took place between Sun Sunjata and Sumauro, and they were lot of dead, and the vultures came and covered the sky. Now, this heroic song is still sung today. It's permanent, it's original, but also it's universal. The, the, when it, when Tuma, from Tumani's, uh, uh, Jabate's father, Siddiqui, to Tumani, it become a kind of uh, modern jazz. And then you go to to Mani Jabate's son, who's now one of the biggest stars of hip hop music in Mali. So they take the same song, but they play it as hip hop, remastered and so on. So, so music, you know, Malian music reaches places. When I go to places, people salute me when I say I'm from Mali, they salute me for the music. They don't salute me for our musicians or our, uh, our politicians or our writers. They salute me. You're from Mali. Do you know Salif Keita? You, you know, you're from Senegal. Do you know Baba Mal? Do you know Isundu? So that porosity uh, of, of barriers that music is able to, to, to establish, I can't think of any genre. So therefore, my aspiration in my writing is to write like the musicians. Mm -hmm. And yet the musicians perform in their own indigenous vocabularies that aren't accessible necessarily to their American audiences, but that doesn't seem to um, create any kind of barrier. No, no it, I think that's the beauty of it. It's, it's, it's like a poem, it has several meanings. Mm -hmm. You know, when you listen to a poem, a, a poem sung in Spanish, you feel like you speak Spanish. When it, 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 listen to a poem in More or in the very ancient Bambara or Bamana, as you'd say nowadays, uh, it looks like you can understand it. When something is beautiful, you, end, you, know, you can understand it. You can travel through it. That's what's good about the music of this area. They, they are, it, it's not just Americans, Alicia, uh, if you allow me. I would say, the, a good music by Banzumana, uh, Jalibaba, by uh, all the way to Salif Keita, 50% of Malians do not understand it. They hear one word here, one word there. But if you sing in the old language, people don't understand it. I have to listen to a song many times because I work in this. I, sometimes I listen to a song maybe 20 times to know what they are saying. You know, uh, when uh, Banzumana Sisoko uh, says, he's, he wants to say something like the country, he's trying to criticize the coup d'etat, but he says it in ancient Bambara, the Jamana Frekisera. So at I listen and listen. I say, what, what word is this? I had to actually listen, uh, ask another griot. I know the meaning of the word, but I have never heard it sung. So mm -hmm. somebody has to tell me the meaning. So in a sense, the point is, yes, in some sense, the word makes sense of what is happening in the world. But because it's a poem, it has several interpretations, several readings. So it doesn't matter if you don't get it straight. The more you listen to it, the more you get it. And that, I think the mundane music succeeded in doing that to a point that people now say the blues uh, was born in Mali. Now, I'm not interested in that, for example. Those are the kind of things I'm not interested in. But it's because 
is so poetic that he can make the blues, uh, he can make Mali music like country music, like the blues, like jazz, like rock and roll. That's what is interesting to me. How come Mali, Malian music, Mandan music speak to all these different forms of music? And how do they do that in a way without losing their identity? That's so crucial to me. You know, he can exchange with the other, uh, relate to the other, do everything with the other, but you're still yourself. You haven't lost yourself. You haven't been alienated, you know? So that's what's beautiful about uh, the, the music of this area. You see uh, Salif Keita play with Santana. It's as if he has never left Mali, but yet he has gone through the history of rock and roll. You know, you see Ali Farka Ture, when we were in a, a school, uh, in the schoolyard in Baradaji in Bamako, Ali Farka Ture used to sing James Brown songs before he started doing the blues that you know today. So, uh, and you can see this in many Malian musicians, or Guinean for that matter. A question that I had uh, about In Search of Africa and um, how you structure that book, one of the things that I find um, very moving and very poignant is how throughout the book, you come back to a quest of your own um, it's, a, it's almost a, in the epic tradition to reconnect with uh, your childhood friendship that you had left behind in Sekuture's Guinea when your family was obliged to leave and return to Mali. And in the course of your investigations, when you're finally uh, reunited with your friend, your childhood friend, Sidi Mei Lai, you discover that by remaining in Guinea, the path that he wound up following in life was that of his family's vocation of traditional sculptor. And that is something that really takes you aback because your, your lives you know, took such incredibly different uh, trajectories. And that, narrative that you tell is such a revelatory one. Um, you, it makes us understand the notion of alternative modernities in uh, contemporary society, that your friend is very much following a professional path of many artists in the Sahel who are reproducing historical forms of expression in parallel to contemporary artists who are receiving recognition internationally for developing avant-garde idioms. And that uh, reality uh, really should highlight for all of us the importance of historicizing creativity and authorship and the fact that more often than not, African artists working in historical idioms, like many of those that are foregrounded in the Sahel exhibition, have not received the recognition for their achievements that their peers in other world traditions have been afforded. And so with that in mind, as a museum curator, mm. I wonder how this reality can be redressed moving forward in a context in which information about authorship of individual works in museums from Dakar to New York simply was never documented and so now will be difficult to ever recover. Uh, what is your counsel to those of us who work in cultural institutions of foregrounding this issue and redressing it? Yeah, I, I think you raise again the, 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 the big question between uh, tradition and modernity. Uh, tradition and modernity, but also a kind of Western gaze on Africa. I don't 
think, you know, if you look at the first collectors of African folk tales, of African art, uh, some of the people I admire most from uh, Michel Liris to André Gide uh, to Jean Rouge uh, next door, uh, they still saw African traditions as homogenous, as a kind of monolithic, and all of them speaking with one voice. So the question of author could only uh, relate to the West because you have to have an individual in, in order to have an author. Uh, but by the time they came to Africa, by, by the time of the first contact with Africans, I think that the question of this kind of uh, uh, monolithic traditions uh, had ended because the situation of having foreigner and uh, local together changes both of them. Both the, the visitor and the visited are changed. And this in you know, places like Senegal, place, you know, when we met the Europeans, the idea of having an authentic Bambara died, the, the, the authentic Wolof died, uh, the, the authentic Lebu died, but the Lebu-ness survives by adapting to this change. And, and usually the, the research in the West, from the West, is not kind of shunned, is not interested in the changes. In fact, they take the changes out. They always are looking for authenticity and what is that authenticity? Now, the, the, the story of Sidi Melai still haunts me because I went to school very late. As a son came, my, my relatives had no uh, intention of sending me to school. I was supposed to end up in the marketplace and become a jeweler. Now, uh, when, uh, and, but I, I was playing with the Manding, we call them Mandingo boys. Uh, my, my mother and father didn't have any respect for them because they didn't know how to do business. So, but they were going to school and I, I was envious of them. I wanted to learn uh, French like them. And Sidi Melai was the smartest. He, he taught me how to read in some sense and write before I went to school because I didn't go to school until around 13 years old. So uh, I learned everything from Sidi Melai. And from that uh, beginning to the time I left Guinea, Sidi Melai was still the best student. Better dressed, beautiful, handsome man. So my imagination, when I, I look for this guy, I will find him as a doctor somewhere in Guinea, or he will be in France, or he will be a professor. So I look for Sidi Melai from Kankan to Conakry and find Sidi Melai as a, you know, uh, an artist in the Western sense of the world who makes masks and statues mostly for the tourist market. And as you can see in the book, it, it was in some sense devastating, but also it made me very humble because I thought that becoming a doctor or a professor was more important than becoming an artist. And I'm a person who writes about art, who talk about art, you know, my life, livelihood I get from the art. So in the beginning, my city man like confronted me with myself. What mm -hmm. in this difficulty in myself, in seeing in what he was doing, not as a disappointment, you know, some kind of deception, but in seeing it clearly as the something that he chose to do just as I chose to read and write, uh, it seems some kind of equality between those two levels of things. But when I was there then, uh, our relationship changed much better it, it, since then. But when I was there then, I kept insisting that he sign the work he did for me. And he was reluctant to do it. He said, in our tradition, when we do something for the tradition, we don't sign it. Mm -hmm. And of course, I have always been in a kind of class of some sort. I would say, no, come on, man, sign this for me. And he signed many, many of them. Uh, but, but it says something very important about African art. People do not see African artists as authors. I had this same struggle with Jean Rouge. 
Jean Rousse is considered worldwide as the father of cinema verite, as the best filmmaker in the documentary tradition who influenced even the new wave filmmakers in the 50s. But everything that Jean Rousse developed was from working with his African colleagues in Africa. So it's Jean Rousse who became the author, who survived, that we still know. But his colleagues like Umaru Ganda, uh, Damure, and Lam, only specialists in the field know them. So today the immortality comes from being an author. Whereas with the griots in my, in, in my area, uh, most of the time the tradition was more important. When a griot comes to sing, he or she asks for the permission for other griots in the audience to forgive me, I'm going to sing and I hope I do not offend you. That is, I, I, I don't want to overshine you because I could be cursed. So they made it, if you look at authorship in that sense, people were not fighting to be uh, the author. Of course, you have griots that shine more to, from the audience's perspective, but to be an author was not important to the tradition as much as authorship become important in modernity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So finally, now that the museum is reopening and visitors are going to be able to return to the Met's galleries, how do you think in just a very few words, the relevance of coming to see Sahel will be different than before the pandemic, both in terms of developments in the region and in New York City? Uh, I think that, again, the, question, the point is, you know, in this important question, what do we realize when we see a show like this? Uh, we see in a show like this, what survives of the Sahel, because the Sahel is in, in pieces is today, has crumbled today in many ways. What survived, uh, survived it, it, you know, is the work of art. The work of art, even when we think about the environment of the Sahel, what does the Sahel mean? We have to go to uh, the architecture, we have to go to uh, the music, we have to go to the sculptures, the horsemen, and so on, to see this is what the Sahel was. Uh, the, so, in a sense, for us in West Africa, your show brings in a coherence an understanding of ourselves that we can no longer have. Today, uh, we have moved to another level uh, of, you know, people uh, uh, killing one another, uh, either because of religious belief or economic beliefs and so on. Uh, and I think the same thing for, for, for America, uh, and for New York specifically, it kind of remind us of the, the importance, the significance of the environment, the, the ecosystem that produced this Sahel show. Are we doing things here now that could destroy us? So I think COVID-19 really gave all of us to seize the time, to remember the time and think about it and hold on to it and see how precious it is. I think that that is, when I look at the show, it is time and environment that become really important to me uh, in many ways. Yeah. So uh, Mantia, I know that this is the eve of a, uh, your first journey out of New York City uh, since the pandemic, uh, you're headed back to the region. And um, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time to share your wisdom with us. Thank you and congratulations for the show. <laughs>